Lady. اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر اشد اللہ الہ الا اللہ اشد انہ محمد رسول اللہ حیاء علیہ السلام حیاء علیہ الفلاح قد قامت السلام قد قامت السلام اللہ اکبر اللہ اکبر لا الہ الا اللہ استو استقیمو سدو الفرج Strain the lines, close the gaps. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضال الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان وأقيموا الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسروا الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها فاكهة والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان خلق الإنسان من صلصال كالفخار وخلق الجان من مارج من نار فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان رب المشرقين ورب المغربين فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان مرج البحرين يلتقيان بينهما برزخ لا يبغيان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان يخرج منهما اللؤلؤ والمرجان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان وله الجوار المنشآت في البحر كالأعلام فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان كل من عليها فان ويبقى وجه ربك ذو الجلال والإكرام فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان الله أكبر <تصفيق> سمع الله لمن حمده الله 
أكبر <تصفيق> الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Brother Saiful and sisters Lima and the whole family for this excellent uh, suhoor this morning. May Allah accept all their efforts and uh, as ibadah and also help bar give barakah to their family in their, all their efforts. Ameen. الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. So inshallah today we will discuss some of the prophets of Allah that came in Bani Israel after Musa عليه السلام. Uh, one of them being Ilyas عليه السلام. Ilyas عليه السلام, and he's mentioned two times in the Quran as Ilyas. And one time he's mentioned as Ilyasin. Ilyasin and Ilyas. Both are, both are uh, thought to be the same person. <clears throat> uh, Ilyas alayhi salam was sent as a prophet to Banu Israel after another prophet, which is mentioned in the Sirah called Haskil. Banu Israel at that time were worshippers of an idol named uh, Baal. Baal. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Ilyas said to his people, Fear Allah, do you call upon Baal and leave the best of creatures, uh, best of creators? I'm sorry. Allah is your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers. So Banu Israel disbelieved and they called, uh, Ilyas called them to worship Allah only at first. Their king believed in Ilyas, but later he apostated. Ilyas prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala withheld rain for three days. They asked Ilyas to pray to relieve them and promised they would believe him. Rain came, but they still disbelieved. So Ilyas prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take him to him, meaning uh, he said, Ya Allah, you know, these people are not believing. So uh, I have, you know, reached my limit that you deal with them. And he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Another prophet which is mentioned, again, these are very, very little details that are mentioned in the Quran, uh, sometimes only a name, <coughs> sometimes a tiny little story, and then the rest is basically uh, drawn from some of the Israeliyat. Uh, some of them are not known to be Israeliyat, meaning that there is something uh, called, there isn't actually a name for it, but basically there were some Sahaba who would learn from people who used to narrate Israeliyat. So when they learn from them and they would discuss these stories with them, they would say, okay, well, so you know, those rabbis, monks, they became Muslim, so they would have discussions among themselves. They'd say, okay, so what do you have in your 
in your previous religion's literature uh, about so and so. So sometimes those Sahaba would then narrate that as additional details. So that's what we mentioned before that whatever does not come from directly from the Quran and Sunnah, then we need to always take that with a huge grain of salt. Now another prophet that is mentioned in the Quran twice, his name is Al Yasa. <coughs> Al Yasa. <coughs> Al Yasa became a prophet after Ilyas alayhi salam. Ibn Asakir says that he was from the progeny of Yusuf bin Yaqub bin Ishaq bin Ibrahim alayhi salam, and he was the cousin of Ilyas. He lived among Banu Israel, calling them to Allah and the laws of Ilyas. Majority of the people did not believe in him. Um, then another prophet, which is uh, mentioned in the Sirah but not in the Quran, is. Uh, Samuel or Samuel and in the Bible he's called Samuel Samuel <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is um, mention okay <coughs> so what happened with Banu Israel is that for a period of time after Musa alayhi salam Banu Israel followed the general straight path meaning they're still on the manhaj of Musa alayhi salam but after some time they started to go astray and prophet after prophet was sent to them at one time prophethood halted among various tribes of Banu Israel only one pregnant woman remained of the offspring of Levi or Levi in whom the prophethood still appeared the woman gave birth to Samuel or Samuel and he became a prophet now in the Quran we are told the story that the people uh, they came to uh, their prophet وَقَالَ لَهُمْ نَبِيُّهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَدْ بَعَثَ لَكُمْ طَالُوتًا مَلِكًا that they were in a state of weakness they needed to go and they needed to fight and <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they came to their prophet and they said appoint for us a king so the Mufassireen say that the, the prophet that is mentioned in these ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah is this prophet which is <coughs> Samuel uh, or Samuel. So Banu Israel asked their prophet according to the, the Quran to appoint a king to lead them in a war against the Philistines. Philistines were a people that lived in the area and the prophet feared that when the time would come they would refuse because he said that that what if you know perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make jihad obligatory upon right now you're asking for it but if it comes as an obligation then you're going to cower and you're going to run away from it which is worse so it's better to <coughs> not ask for an obligation to have a burden on you but they assured him that they were ready they assured him we are ready don't worry about it we are ready to go so then the prophet chose Talut who is called Saul in the Bible to be their king but Banu Israel they didn't like him <laughs> so you know this is the test where when you really want to be united when you want to be united one of the tests of your commitment to unity is who the leader is is not always liked by everyone the person who emerges as the person who's kind of maybe leading the coalition like think about this that in today's world we all wished the Muslim Ummah was united under one leadership but <clears throat> but what is there to tell us that if the Muslim Ummah is united under one leadership then that leader will be someone that we like majority of us will have oh I don't like this about him I don't like that about him and we'll have so many problems So they said that we don't like him, we don't like him, but he gave them, <coughs> he said that Inna Allah qad ba'atha lakum taluta malika, and Allah says, uh, he says that Allah has chosen him because he's tall and sturdy, and he is pious, he's intelligent, and Allah had chosen him for these reasons. <coughs> they said that he's not from a noble family, nor does he have any wealth, as if that these are the things that are important, but 
the Prophet told them that the sign of blessings of Talut's kingship what would be the sign? The sign would be that Allah would give them a tabut, a wooden box that had been stolen from Banu Israel and it will be brought back to them by the angels. And it is said that in this wooden box were, <clears throat> what were they? They, they were like, uh, you know, the, the staff of Musa alayhi salam and personal, um, you could say, artifacts of Musa and Harun alayhi salam. And this was kind of like the pride of the nation. And this was something that the Philistines had stolen from them as a way to humiliate them. <clears throat> so uh, he said that as a sign of his being your leader and this being a blessing for you, Allah will bring you back this. So if this happens, which is something that is impossible, if this happens, it means that Allah has chosen him and you should have the confidence in him and follow him. <clears throat> so uh, the tabut, <clears throat> they call it the Ark of the Covenant. It contained the Torah. It contained a container of manna and the staff of Musa alayhi salam. So Banu Israel had always carried this ark everywhere, even in battles. It gave them peace of mind and courage, and they considered it holy. They believed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them from enemies because of it. An army from Babylon invaded Al-Quds and kicked Banu Israel out, and they took the ark of covenant away from them. So it wasn't the Philistines. <clears throat> so then Talut leads the army out to go to jihad. And of course, what's the problem in this army? No army can, um, so the cohesion of the unit is very important. That they must work together with each other and they must follow their leadership. If you don't have that, you're going to have a problem. Now, Talud did not put together this army. This army <clears throat> put together themselves. Perhaps there were those among them who wanted to be appointed the king. Perhaps there were those among them who had other motivations. Now Talut, being the wise man and intelligent person, he could not take this army as is. Because you're going to basically have a lot of friendly fire. And you're going to have a lot of internal problems. You cannot take them on an uh, important mission like this. So Talut said to them <clears throat> that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you with a river. Allah will test you with a river that we will pass by. Whoever drinks from it would not be allowed to remain in the army. Except whoever drinks only a handful, they can remain. So <clears throat> the qadr of Allah and the blessing of Allah was such that whoever remained, whoever only drank a handful, their thirst was quenched. And whoever drank more, they kept drinking more, kept drinking more, they couldn't stop. And they basically became like, if, if you try to sneak a second handful out or fill up a bottle or something secretly, it made you even more thirsty that you kept going back. So basically, in a, after some time, it's very clear who are the people who drank more and they're still drinking. So this basically filtered the army out. And what remained was a number, which is <coughs> said to be around the exact same number that the army of the Battle of Badr had. The army of the Battle of Badr, around 315, 17, 13, around this number. This was the remaining number of the, the army of Talut as well. And the scholars have said that this is a blessed number. This is a blessed number th such that <clears throat> this important battle that is mentioned in the Quran, actually both of them are mentioned in the Quran, that they have the same number. And both of them are heavily, heavily disadvantaged against the opposing army. But <clears throat> they were able to uh, win in this battle. So majority of them drank from the river except a few. The few soldiers that obeyed Talud crossed the river with him. Eventually they met <clears throat> the enemy's army. And the enemy's army had <clears throat> a man who was called Jalut. And Jalut was a huge and strong warrior. So <clears throat> these people, they prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said, O oh Lord, put forth on us patience. Afrig alayna sabra wa thabbit aqdamana wa ansurna al qawm al kafirin. And make us victorious over the disbelieving people. So Jalut came out and challenged 
this was something that they used to do is that some big warrior would come out and he would say, who among you can come and fight me? <coughs> so no one wants to fight him because Jalut was such a big giant that you would be scared to just look at him, let alone get struck by him. Now, recently I read a very good book on this matter. It is written from a biblical perspective, from the details of the Bible. But basically, they go into a lot of analysis uh, of, it's called David and Goliath. And it says that, that Jalut had a, a tumor on his brain, which is something which is a diagnosable condition now in a certain spot, and if you have that, then your body does not know when to stop growing. So you keep growing, you keep growing. However, it also has other side effects as well. It has other side effects as well, and one of them is that your vision is bad. So in the Bible, it is mentioned that Jalut was led by another person out. So meaning, He's a big warrior, but he doesn't come alone. Someone leads him to the spot where he comes and offers a challenge. So, <clears throat> and then it is says that David had a stick in his hand, which is the stick that he would use to basically do the slinging. And uh, Jalut in the biblical tradition says that, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? So they said, why did he say sticks when David only had one stick? So they said that perhaps he also had double vision. He had double vision. So <clears throat> either way, uh, Jalut, according to this, could only fight in close quarters. So this book is all about that if you are facing a huge enemy, a huge challenge, <clears throat> and it, has, it goes into many examples of classrooms, governments, all sorts of examples based on the same scenario where you, on one side you have David who's small and no one thinks that he can win and on the other side is Jalut. <coughs> so um, <coughs> Dawood alayhi uh, salam <coughs> it is said that when Talut said okay who is going to go fight Jalut? So everyone is like not me. <laughs> so Dawood <coughs> alayhi salam he's a shepherd boy and it is said by some of them, uh, the, the, his, the Mufassireen who are kind of writing this history, that he wasn't even there to fight. He was there because his brothers were in the army and he came by to drop them food. And he said, you know what, I will take care of him. So Talut asked him that you are such a, and he was, he was a shepherd boy that he was still probably in his teenage years. He hadn't fully grown yet, so he was short and skinny and not experienced, not wise, none of that. But Talut said, that, do you know how to fight? He said, well, <clears throat> I don't really know how to fight. But if I'm a shepherd, if a wolf looks at my sheep the wrong way, I knock his teeth out. Meaning his aim was so good. <clears throat> and actually, you know that that what Dawood alayhi salam did is actually an Olympic sport, right? It's called slinging. And they have different, like basically they go around with their arm and they, and they go throw this to see who can throw it the farthest. <coughs> Palestinians are the best, yes. You know, Israeli tanks are no match. Um, so they have all the armor and everything, but subhanAllah, that one rock scares them. So the... So Dawood alayhi salam, he could fling a rock at such a speed and accuracy that it is, so again in this book he says that a modern equivalent of it is like being shot by a handgun. Okay, so basically somebody shoots you with a handgun. This is how fast and how accurate the slinging of Dawood alayhi salam was. That Jalud came and he is completely covered in armor and he has only a slight opening somewhere around above his neck, maybe his eye or his neck or something. <clears throat> and Dawood alayhi salam, he doesn't even get close to Jalut when the challenge begins. He just stay, keeps his distance where Jalut cannot do anything to him. And he basically flings a rock and within seconds, Jalut is down. Now in the biblical tradition, 
Jalut had said that if you beat me, my army will give up. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَقَتَلَ دَاوُودُ جَالُوتَ وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ That basically after Jalut was killed, there wasn't much of a battle. Usually what happens is when you have your, all your assets in one egg, which is Jalut, and that egg just popped. So <coughs> immediately the morale is lost and it's just found to be, you know, what do we do now? We don't have anyone to lead us or anything like that. So... <coughs> Uh, Dawood, uh, he, he took his sling, placed a pebble in it, and shot at Jalut. It hit Jalut's head and killed him instantly. When the two armies saw this, they started fighting with each other, but it was very easily <coughs> won by Banu Israel. The boy who killed Jalut was Dawood, who later became a king and a prophet. <coughs> now, it is said that before uh, Dawood had come forth, <coughs> Talut said that whoever goes out and fights Jalut, I will marry my daughter to him to incentivize him because no one was coming forward. Now, he is the king. So if you get married to his daughter, you're basically kind of becoming a prince. So Dawood salam, did the job and he wasn't even probably interested in that, but he... Uh, married Talu's daughter and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَآتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him kingdom and hikmah, wisdom kingdom and wisdom now he is mentioned in the Quran 16 times 16 times <coughs> and is it correct that sunrise today is at 7.16 And how many times Dawood is mentioned in the Quran? 16 times. <laughs> so Dawood alayhi salam, he came from Banu Lah Bayt Laham, which is Bethlehem, as they call it now, uh, in Palestine. And he was from the pro progeny of Yahud bin Yaqub. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Dawood alayhi salam with kingdom, with wisdom, and gave him prophethood and <clears throat> a book called Zabur or Psalms in English, and sound judgment, and a beautiful voice with 70 different tones, understanding the language of animals and ability to mold iron in his, with his hands. So subhanAllah, look at <coughs> all the blessings of Allah <coughs> upon him, that he gave him Zabur, and he gave him a beautiful voice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> tells us that the, when he would recite the Zabur and make the Tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mountains and the birds joined him. So, <clears throat> one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu his name was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. And Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, when he would recite the Quran, it was so beautiful that the Prophet sallallahu said that he has inherited some of what was given to Dawood alayhi salam. Imagine what a recitation of Abu Musa it must be. <clears throat> and then imagine what the recitation of Dawood alayhi salam must be. And how, what does it feel like? We probably will never be able to really fully experience that, that the mountains and the birds are joining him along with him. But you can imagine that a rhythm is created. And you could imagine like... Uh, <clears throat> As if that if you're in that area, you don't know where the sound is originating from. It sounds like it's coming from this tree, it's coming from that tree, it's coming from that tree. So in, in a modern way to understand it, imagine that every tree was a speaker. And every bird was a speaker. So when he recites on the mic, which there isn't any, all the speakers are conveying his sound. And even today, by the way, when you go in a masjid, the, sound, the sign of a good sound system is what? This is for the sound brothers. <clears throat> the sign of a good sound system is that you cannot tell where the sound is coming from. The sound is immersive, okay? You're like, so it's like when the speakers are not set right, you can clearly tell the sound is coming from there. 
because there is more there and less here, so your ears are able to pick. But the right setting is where everything is filled with equal amount of sound, where you feel like it's coming from inside of you. So this, this is the place where you start, you know, sometimes when there's a powerful recitation, it has such a powerful impact on you because it feels like the sound is coming from inside of you. And, and there is some research, by the way, about, <coughs> about the, recita the vibrations created by the recitations of the Quran. And that uh, for a lot of people, uh, you know, what we recommend from what I've learned from my teachers is that if there's someone sick, let's say somebody's in ICU, somebody's on a ventilator, they really, really, there's not much you can do except hope for good, then put Quran on, but they said, put Quran on headphones and put them in his ears. So basically, again, signs of good headphones is that you can't tell if it's coming from here or from here, but if it's coming from the middle of your brain, because the two are meeting in the middle. So <clears throat> that creates vibrations, and it is, uh, there has been some research that shows that it, is, it has some positive impact has some positive impact. So, what an amazing hear, a sight to see and a sound to hear it would be to hear Dawood alayhi salam. <clears throat> now, he's also given the ability to understand the language of the animals. He can understand the language of the animals and this is something that's given to his son later on as well. <clears throat> and he's been given the ability to mold iron with his hands. So, uh, anything that is met, made of iron, if he touches it, it's soft in his hand. He lets it go, it's hard for everyone else. He touches it, it's soft, he can mold it in any way that he likes. So, <clears throat> Dawood alayhi salam, even though he was a king, but every righteous king, they do not consider the wealth of Bayt al-Mal to be their mal. So in our Ummah, this only remained until Khilafa al rashida After that, every king that came, they basically considered Bayt al-Mal to be their own personal property. So that's how they were able to give it to their brother, their cousin, their uncle. But the Khulafa al-Rashidin, they did not consider it to be their own wealth. So Dawood alayhi salam, he used to use uh, this ability that Allah had given him of having iron soft in his hand, and he would make out of it uh, what is called chain mail. Chain mail, so some of, the <coughs> some of the scholars, they said that chain mail was essentially invented by Dawood alayhi salam. What we call invention, but for him, it was him using his ability to come up with a unique way to have a shield to protect your body because the normal armor was an armor plate, a just a huge piece of metal in front of you. So if somebody strikes you with a sword, they can't get through. Now the problem with that used to be is that it's very heavy and it is very hard to maneuver yourself because it's all solid metal, it doesn't turn. So he came up with these little rings that all connect in a chain mail where you basically wear it like a shirt. <clears throat> It molds to your body, but if someone strikes you with a sword, it won't go through. So it is an efficient use of that same idea, but more efficient. And Dawood alayhi salam used to make that, sell that, and make his earnings to survive on from that, although he was a king. Although he was a king. Dawood alayhi salam was always in a state of worship and he fasted every other day. He fasted every other day, and he cried a lot out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the Prophet sallallahu said <clears throat> that the most beloved fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the fast of Dawood alayhi salam, which is he would fast one day and not fast one day. Fast one day and not fast one day. <clears throat> so even though Dawood was a king, he earned his own living. He was the first man who invented armor. <clears throat> One of the du'as that is mentioned uh, as the du'a of Dawood alayhi salam, it is mentioned in Tirmidhi, he said that, Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbak wa hubba man yuhibbuk wal amala alladhi yuballighuni hubbak Allahumma ja'al hubbak 
أحب إلي من من نفسي وأهلي ومن الماء البارد ومن الماء البارد. He said that, Oh Allah, I ask you for your love, the love of those who love you, and the deeds which will cause me to attain your love. Oh Allah, make your love dearer to me than myself, my family, and cold water. Cold water. Min al ma'il barid. So, <coughs> Dawood alayhi salam, he, there's a story mentioned that we read a few days ago in Surah Al-Sa'd. Dawood alayhi salam, he is being trained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And part of his training is to be able to administer justice properly. So one day while Dawood alayhi salam is in his mihrab, uh, mihrab is basically like an area which you dedicate to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> so two men climb over the wall into Dawood's house and they wanted him to judge between them. They wanted him to judge between them. So <coughs> one of them, he starts speaking and he says that, uh, Inna hadha akhi lahu tis'un wa tis'un na'ja. This is my brother. And he has 99, he has 99 goats, and I have one, and he wants to take the one from me. He wants to take the one from me. <clears throat> or he, he ha already took his one goat. So Dawood alayhi salam, he said that indeed your brother has oppressed you. Your brother has oppressed you, um, that he wants to take even one he, he has 99 and you have one and he even wants to take that. Afterwards, he realized that he made a mistake. And what was that? Uh, um, when we say a mistake, we would say basically he's in training and he made a judgment error. And what is that judgment error that he made? He didn't hear from both sides, right? Because when you hear from the other side, how do you know that that one wasn't stolen by that guy. This is actually something, you know, like um, in America you have all these lawyers who always want to sue, and every second ad is about a lawyer. He says, hey, just give us a call. You don't have to pay us anything. We will file a lawsuit. So now they love it if a commercial vehicle hit you because commercial vehicle insurance policy is much bigger. So the strategy is that we're going to go, we're going to claim this. <coughs> they have a huge insurance policy which pays out. If we give them enough of a headache, they will say, okay, here, take $50,000 and leave us alone. And that's basically what happens in probably, you know, 90% of the cases where simply because you make a claim and you're just giving them a headache, and they understand that if we go to trial where they can actually prove you to be a liar, but to go to that process is very expensive and very time consuming. So, you know what, let's just give them what it would cost us one day of trial and trial could last for months sometimes. So we, not, let's not go through that, let's just give them, pay them off and let's get out of it. So basically that's the strategy. So whenever somebody comes to you with a claim, it's really important to hear both sides, to hear both sides one of the things that uh, I do is that a lot of times people come to me and they tell me their very, very heartbroken story about the, all the bad things that have happened. So I tell them that, look, what I'm going to tell you now, I'm telling you this assuming that everything you're telling me is true. But this cannot be verified until I talk to the other side. <clears throat> so anything I tell you, if anything you are telling me is not true, then what I'm telling you doesn't apply to you. Because sometimes only one person comes and talks to me, the other person doesn't want to come and talk to me. So I tell them, okay, I'll give you advice based on this assumption 
that what you are telling me is 100% true and there is nothing missing in it. If there is, then what I'm telling you doesn't apply in this case. <clears throat> so uh, he realized that he rushed into judgment and he did not hear the second brother's side of the story. So he prostrated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and repented to him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave him. Now, um, I had a point that I forgot to mention. Okay, so Dawood alayhi salam, okay, yeah, this is the point. Now, who were these two people? Do we know that from any hadith or ayah? So the majority of the mufassirin, they say that these were angels in the form of men to send to test him. And there are other hadith of this, um, this type where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends an angel with a um, scenario in order to test someone or in order to teach someone or in order to give them a good news. So based on this, some of the scholars, they say that acting is allowed if it is done for a good reason with certain rules. So if you are an actor, they say that uh, sin should never appear to be glorified. If you're going to act, the sin, if you are uh, playing a sinful person, then the drama or the play, it should always show that sinfulness does not lead to success, as it does in the other stuff where, you know, the bad guy is the hero of the movie. <clears throat> and uh, they have other rules with regards to the prophets of Allah, uh, with the Sahaba, and, you know, uh, that there is... What, what can you say, what can you not say. So there are certain rules with regards to that, but essentially they say that for a person to play, to act out a scenario for educational purposes, it is not something which is forbidden. The, the strict fat, fatwa of some of the scholars is that, no, no, it's not allowed because you're lying. But essentially, you are not lying. Uh, well, essentially, you're not lying, you're creating a scenario to teach a lesson. So in education, if your intention is to educate the people, then it is allowed. But if you are not doing it for the purpose of education, you're doing it for the purpose of profit making, for example. You are lying about a scenario that didn't happen in order to get some money out of someone, then that is something which is not allowed. <clears throat> that is considered lying. So Dawood alayhi salam, So I think that what we can do is we can stop here and we'll continue inshallah tomorrow. I need to read some of this. Um, and then inshallah the next prophet after Dawood alayhi salam will talk about is his son Sulaiman alayhi salam who was given some of the most amazing blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, inshallah we will discuss that tomorrow if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك <coughs> That's a good question. The question is, how does the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم's recitation compare to the recitation of Dawood عليه السلام? Um, I have to read a little bit about this. I have to research what the scholars have said. But remember that what you are reciting also matters. So it is said that, that, that um, Zabur was essentially a book of du'as. It was essentially a book of glorification. It was not a book of laws. It was not a book of rules and regulations. And we all know that rules and regulations, they are recited in a different way than du'as. Du'as tend to be full of um, what you call emotion, and um, it's not like, you know, reading, okay, this is what Allah has said. So uh, I will, inshallah, look into it, but some of the scholars say that every prophet's miracles that they were given, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
sum of that and greater. That he was the last messenger and he had the best of the best. So the same thing they say about with regards to the beauty when they talk about the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam that you know Aisha radiallahu anha said but it could be considered to be maybe her personal view which is that she said that the <clears throat> the women who cut their hands when they saw Yusuf they didn't see uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had they seen them they would have um, what would they have cut Hmm? I think I forgot the word that she used, but they would have cut a lot more than just their fingers had they seen him. And one of the companions, he said that I look at the beauty of the moon and I look at the Prophet wasallam, and I cannot decide which one is more beautiful. But then I came to the realization that the Prophet wasallam, is more beautiful. So are these relative statements or absolute statements? This is where the scholars differ, but inshallah I'll read up about it and inshallah I'll try to share it tomorrow. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum.